by mutual agreement in a coin toss, I'm going to go first. Um, it's good to be here in Egypt. Did, did I pronounce that correctly? Egypt. Get that, clear that up right up front. Uh, this is a presentation that, I, that it's, kind of, it's a preview of a presentation that I'm going to do in um, at Cornell on the 30th of this month. And it's sort of a, sort of a different departure for me. Dr. Ingrafi is going to be there, Lou Olstadt, who is an uh, executive president, vice president at Mobile, um, Jerry Acton, a systems engineer, and uh, Brian Brock, a retired uh, geologist. We're going to do a group presentation about what the prospects uh, are for shale gas in New York State. We've known this, or Lou Olstadt and I have known this for a couple of years. It's kind of by gentleman's agreement, at least in Lou's case, it would apply. Um, we haven't talked about it much. Uh, then Jerry Acton, a systems engineer, started to pretty much came to the same conclusion. And he started making presentations. And we, at that point, we just decided we, we might as well get together and, and, and do a joint presentation, <clears throat> of which this is a part, because we all had come to pretty much the same conclusions. And that is that um, at, at, at from the outset, uh, there's a tendency to overstate the productivity of these horizontal shale plays. That's been the history. So the first horizontal uh, sh development was actually a limestone development called the Austin Shaw in Central Texas, where horizontal drilling technology was used uh, extensively and commercially and successfully. And um, the, from the outset, the, the problem was is that um, unlike conventional drilling, vertical drilling, so these formations can be fairly large. Uh, and the, the initial production of the wells, the horizontal wells, can be fairly, fairly high. For instance, one of the wells that was drilled in the Austin Chalk set the state record for national production for an oil well, an all time state record, because of the nature of the technology. And if you put those two things together, this, you know, this large spatial area of, of the reservoir and the, these high initial productions, it tends to be misleading, because in other words, you've got this, you're looking at this massive area. <clears throat> in the case of the Marcellus, it's, you know, it's huge. Uh, and then you look at these, what often very high production, and you put the two together mentally and you extrapolate, you think, my golly, you know, that's like, wow, in Saudi Arabia. And of course, the news always, um, or t well, typically, they will um, uh, promote or they'll um, uh, th uh, talk about the gushers, the, about the top producers. They make the news. The, the dry holes hardly ever make the news unless they have a problem with them, unless they leak. So, so anyway, so you've got kind of three <coughs> sort of things that can tend to be misleading. You've got this great area. Um, you have these uh, high initial productions that are typical of most of the producing world. And then you have the news media talking about the gushers. And then, the, you know, the gusher story would, would entail the landowner or whatever, the operator that drilled the gusher. And that kind of, that, that makes, that can end up being a little misleading. The, the, um, the nature of the, of a conventional well, a vertical well, is, is that it, it hits a trap uh, of oil or gas. And it's the spatial extent can, that, that would be to the left, that uh, Derek, um, uh, tapping into a, a, a pocket of gas that's in a trap. It tends to be limiting by just the, the size of that trap. So in other words, you drill a well, a step out well away from the discovery well, and at some point you begin to get a sense of how big that, that a field would be, and typically not very large. And as opposed to, say, a shale formation, which can extend, like in the case of the Marcellus, under virtually an entire state, the Pennsylvania, so that uh, right from the outset, when you get wells into a shale formation, the, the gushers are going to be overstated. And since the shale formation is pervasive in some areas, then 
again, you 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 begin to. It's easy to sort of think in terms of having a gusher throughout that entire area. It's by and just to tell you right up front, it's never happens that way. I mean, that what I just said happens, but it's never. It's the, it's not those these shale formations or horizontal formations or formations that are drilled horizontally are never universally pr they're, uh, productive, amorphous. The sort of the hot shale play before the Marcellus, and they, they've gone kind of in sequence, at least in the media, was the Haynesville, which was in uh, many counties in eastern Texas and, and central um, Louisiana going up towards uh, Arkansas. And initially, because of the size of the formation, uh, there was a lot of leasing activity. There was a lot of optimism about it. What happened was is that, and this is true of all these formations, is, is that the actual productive area then would consolidate it fairly rapidly into what amounted to right at the corner of three counties in Louisiana, meaning um, towards the end of its productivity, it's, it's not very productive now because of the price of gas. Is, is it, it, if it went from being a, a very large area in Texas and Louisiana into being just the corner of three counties. <clears throat> and uh, the re there's a lot of reasons for that, but the, but the, the, the fact is, is that the shale itself is not, um, it's the productivity of it is not amorphous. In fact, it, it varies a lot. In the Haynesville, there's, <clears throat> there's, there's, a, there's all sorts of variables. This is, the, this is a map of the, the sort of the gross area of the, uh, of the Marcellus in Pennsylvania, southeast. Uh, or southwest Pennsylvania uh, to the left, northeast to the right. So the the, the counties of uh, Bradford, Susquehanna that are adjacent to uh, New York are shown in the upper right. And the the blue area is basically areas where it's not productive at all. Uh, light blue uh, subpar. The white areas would be the considered average for the Marcellus. And then the darker areas, the yellow, red, would be high high production areas. So Dimmock is kind of right in the middle of that of those that top three counties there with the town in Bradford County, and that's that's what you hear about. That's what gets covered in the press, and there's not you know you don't hear too much about the dry holes. You do hear lately or in the last year or so about rigs moving out of this area and going to to Ohio and, and other places. The the way that uh, the, the problem with, with, with all this is, well, for, for openers, is it's very easy to gain this financially. What you, in other words, if you, <clears throat> once a shale basin is identified, uh, operators will come in and lease up as much of it as they can, as inexpensively as they can, and frankly, for as long as they can. Uh, they will drill test wells, and then they will take the results of the best wells and they will extrapolate them over their holdings and, you know, tell the, the financial press and the, the popular press that, you know, they've got so many acres leased in such and such a state and that they hit a well in such and such a town and it did so and so. Uh, they'll, they'll mass their bad results and, and usually the, there's code words for this, but it's like, you know, the, it's like operator error. If they don't, if they don't like the well, then they had a problem with the well. You know, they had to go fish something out of it, or, or you know, they had a problem with it. Or, but it, they'll, they, then of course, if they don't tie it in, if they don't produce it, it won't even get reported. It'll get reported as being in Texas and in Oklahoma and other states, what would happen with the well? So you wouldn't want to talk about it. You just say you had temporarily abandoned it, or it was waiting on, you know, gathering. You wouldn't actually, you wouldn't go to the, you wouldn't, classified as plugged and abandoned because then you're basically admitting that it's a, bra a black, a black, black hole, <laughs> a dry hole. Uh, and there's wells in Louisiana that have been temporarily abandoned on the books for decades. Because the other problem with, 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 the, with the dry hole, obviously, is you have a liability, a plugging and abandonment liability uh, that you have to fulfill on the well. So, so you hear about the gushers and you don't hear about the um, the bad results, and then of course they they take what they the acreage that they that they claim to have proven up, and then they just flip it and go to another state or go to another part of the state, and that's you know in a, in a nutshell that's what happened with Chesapeake and some of these 
other they would it particularly like back in the Haynesville is they basically flipped if you will in grand manner uh, their acreage to a, a foreign company uh, they, or their, their acreage in, in the Fayetteville too so uh, the way the way this happens though and I'll get to the financial part about this in a minute is is that you would um, you'd see that you would drill Oh, say a below average well uh, in, a, in an acreage that you've leased up, and you wouldn't produce it, you'd test it, you'd log it, whatnot. Then you'd drill a dry hole, say, in the same acreage you'd leased. Then you might drill and test what looked to be an above average, another above average, a dry hole. And you, maybe you can see where I'm going with this. <laughs> slightly below average, slightly below. None of these have been produced. I mean, they may have been test frack, and they would test the uh, uh, the the gas, but they won't actually hook them up. And then guess what? And then if I can get this thing to work, uh, it's, I'm a Mac guy living in a PC world. Um, then they hit a big well, and then they they frack it, they tie it up, they produce it. And under the regs, under the Security and Exchange Commission regs, which we'll talk about here as soon as I can get my thumb to pull up. Let's go over and do that. Oh, that doesn't want to work either. Um, then they'll take this whole acreage that they have tied up, and because they produce the big well, and they, you know, had a problem <laughs> with the other well, then, then that's how they will report it. That that they'll claim that that acreage, uh, you know, is um, is above average. What do you know? Now, the way that they're able, they've been able to do this is before um, Cheney and Bush, the governor that I didn't work for, <laughs> um, left the White House in October of 2008 is they changed, or Chris Cox, who was the head of the Securities Exchange Commission, they changed the regs on how you can report reserves, undeveloped reserves, I mean, uh, reserves that aren't producing. And they, they basically liberalized it, which is, you know, kind of an odd adjective for Cheney and Bush. But they made, they made it easier to extrapolate uh, or to apply um, call it good results over a larger area. So in other words, they facilitated under the scripts and exchange or the financial reporting, the ability to do what I just showed you, take good results and extrapolate it over a large area. So what happened almost immediately is, is that reserves that weren't actually producing or area, or part of the areas that they had been leased up that weren't actually producing came onto the books of these public companies as being great reserves uh, based on basically some chicanery. And the, 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 the way you do this is, is that you get a petroleum reserve engineer like Neville and Sewell in Houston to basically give you a good number. And, you know, as like we learned at Wharton, the, the, the you know, the, if, and when it comes to doing an appraisal or financial accounting, a balance uh, um, uh, evaluation, you basically, you give it to the accountant, the, the, the right answer is like, you know, what number do you have in mind, sir? And they get the job. And and it's not like all Fidelity Reserves engineers are liars, but I mean, they, under these new rules, they were able to take what they had traditionally been constrained in doing and inflate those, those, uh, those reserves. So this is kind of where the bubble, you know, the shale gas bubble actually started. It started in the same place as the subprime mortgage bubble. It started on Wall Street. You know, it wasn't like, remember this at this, at this time, horizontal uh, drilling and, and frag, hydrofrag, horizontal hydrofrag, high volume, was over 20 years old. It started back in the Austin Chalk and then it moved to the San Juan Basin and the coal seam. So it wasn't like that. There was like this sea change in this. It was just a sea change in the. It was a. It was basically um, Cheney's last hurrah before the, you know before he got in the limo and left town. And of course, Halliburton, who developed um, this technology, was a great beneficiary of this. 
Well, there's a little, there's a button down here somewhere, and I can't find it. Is there another way to make this thing cooperate? Oh, look at that. I just sort of randomly click. <laughs> I don't know if this is the next slide or not, but let's talk about it. Um, so what happens is, in the media, is, is then you, then so you can see this pattern repeating. So first, the first thing you see is this, you know, this map of the Marcella shell being over the entire state of New York. You know, all the way up to the, for the beyond, oh, all, all the way up to the Adirondack. And so, and this, I, this is like the actual headline. It says, this air, the area has the potential for national good. So basically the media is like <coughs> set everybody up to be conned or misled or whatever. Because now you're, you've got this, this huge spatial area, this amorphous, you know, uh, reserve presented to you in the media. So this is what's going to happen. <coughs> Uh, there should be a button down here. Yeah, in fact, it's here. Uh, huh? No, I mean, there should be an arrow. Yeah. One, more arrow. One, more. One more. It's just really light. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Wow. One more. One more. From this. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Okay. What? Huh? Damn. I see what you're talking about, but nothing half is happening. There. Not there. Look at that. That is weird. <laughs> well, are you Egyptians or something? <laughs> <laughs> there. Okay. Yeah, really? Wow. Trying to save it's like money. a dexterity thing. Okay, so the so so anyway, so the Marcellus height was invented by a professor over at um, Penn State. And, uh, and the Energy Information Administration and the, the state of New York bought it. And so basically you have this great formation. And the initial um, estimates were up, you know, up to 500 trillion cubic feet of gas, and it, which, was, which is enough to, this is kind of the, you know, the Wall Street number. Um, this is, by the way, is the technically recoverable, it's not the economically recoverable or whatnot. Um, and then subsequently, even very quickly, though, as soon as they started drilling a lot of wells, that got cut back by about a, a fifth um, uh, by the you know, USGS, the, the Geological Survey. Uh, and so, oops, did I go too far? I think I did. So anyway, so the, but the DEC took the bait and so their, their, their official estimates of what is in New York State, in the Eskies and in Cuomo's mind and in all the press releases, <laughs> um, is the median is 159 TCF. Uh, their high end is, um, is, is, all, is actually more than half of what is in the entire Marcellus in Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and New York. So, you know, you could argue, and this is in the Esky, you could argue, well, maybe, hmm, Maybe they're overstating this a little bit for political purposes, you know, for whatever. Uh, if you take that, the USGS number, the 84, you, so New York is grossly about a quarter of, you know, or a quarter of the Marcellus. Uh, even, and when I say a quarter, I mean the, even that, the big area. So you're looking at maybe 21 TCF in New York. But then what's, then a peculiar thing happens is that the regs, as kind of tawdry as they are in New York State, they begin to limit the amount of that's, amount that's recoverable. And frankly, just the, you know, just the dynamics of drilling a well, you can't drill one everywhere, despite what Kelly and I will tell you later, <laughs> uh, as a practical matter. Uh, so you get, there are zones that have been excluded, you know, excluded famously the reservoirs in New York City. You get there's local ordinances and they're just the practicalities of slopes and, and, and whatnot. And there's been a study done, and I published it here, New York Frack Road restrictions on what those what those uh, aggregate to in terms of restrictions on that gross area. And um, of course, towns have banned it. Uh, towns have moratoriums on it. I would, and Kelly will emphasize this. I would highly encourage. 
the town and the county to take action on these matters because I, I wouldn't expect you know Obama to parachute in here and help huh. me, nor would I expect you know Cuomo to ride to the rescue. Uh, and there's of course, like, as I mentioned, there's these statewide uh, setbacks, from, uh, wetlands and aquifers and whatnot. So what, what's interesting is is that it adds up to about 79 percent of the reserve area. Uh, of the area that would be drilled, which is basically the counties that are adjacent to uh, Pennsylvania, it's like off limits. I, I mean, I, I've read the study, it seems pretty high to me, but I mean, if that's true, then then all of a sudden, even by what the, based on the USGS is published, then you're down to 4.2 TCF in New York, which means that the, they're off by, um, you know, as much as 56 times the, the state of New York, the S guys. So, I mean, they're overstating this, even uh, from that analysis, you know, 10 times to 56 times, which is the dis, uh, USGS data, peer-reviewed studies. What's TCF? A trillion, cu trillion cubic feet. Uh, listen, by the way, we're going to try and hold every, all the questions until the bitter end. <coughs> uh, now, and that's even before we got to the, the geology of the matter. The, the interesting thing about, um, and Lou Allstadt has done a good bit of work on this, is, is that the shale in New York has been tested like a lot. I mean, hundreds of test wells. They've gone back years. Uh, there's been a talk about where the fairway would be, and I'll show you how it's more of a rough than a fairway. And I don't even play golf. I'm not sure what either of those things mean. Um, we and Jerry Acton has projected the results of Pennsylvania and the New York State. I'll go over that real quickly, and then I'll show you where they where the actual drilling permits are from people from basically credible build, uh, builders, drillers that would uh, that might actually drill a well here. The first thing is all these is to think that all these wells that have been logged, the data is available in terms of what what their carbon content, whether it's oil, wet gas, dry gas, how thick the formation is, what the pressure is of the formation, both as a function of the depth and what the internal pressure is. The density, the porosity, and all this stuff is generally known on these wells that have been logged. And the key thing here is, is that a lot of this logging has gone down to the Black River. In other words, a lot of these test wells have gone through both of the shales that we're going to talk about, from gone down to the Oro Divisian right through the Silurian that nobody evidently cares about, uh, and to the Devonian where these, or through the Devonian where these shales are. So uh, this, is a, this is a map of just some of the, uh, the logging that's been done on wells that have, gone, that have gone through both of these shales. This is the Black River uh, Trenton uh, wells that have been logged. Uh, the, and the interesting thing about the Marcellus in both states, but in particularly true in New York, is that it's actually more than one shale. It's actually the Marcellus shales. Um, and that is and it's composed of two main intervals. One of them is the, the top one is called the Oatka Creek, which, is, which I have learned is some creek out in the western part of the state. And uh, the other one is the Union Springs, which is some town out in the Finger Lakes. So the, the thing is, the key thing here is the Oka Creek, which is actually the thicker part of the shale, and the Marcellus Shales in New York, is what they call gray shale, meaning it doesn't have much carbon in it, doesn't have much of anything, much gas, dry gas, no oil. The Union Springs is pretty rich, to put it mildly, with carbon, it's dry gas, but that's basically the target down in Pennsylvania. So then you look at how thick is the Union Springs in New York, and you find that it doesn't get to be more than 100 feet thick just about anywhere in the state. It's a couple 300 feet thick down in Pennsylvania. The, and the, and the, at this point, the key thing here is, is that if, if, this, if it's not thick enough, it's kind of hard, it's not exactly worth, may not be worth much to frack it horizontally, because think about it, you've got to pay a whole lot of money to drill a lateral, right, to, if you got lucky and went through it right to the middle of it, it's only going to be 50 feet thick on either side of it, 
and the frack is capable of going like a, as much as a thousand feet or more. So it's like the economics get to be kind of iffy. I mean, there's other variables, namely the the carbon content, but still, mm, I don't think so. You know, just the, just at the from the outset, it's another isopac map of the thickness. It looks kind of like a parrot for some reason. It has stopped drinking, um, but um, and it's and you know that the eye of the parrot. Uh, it's, I know that's really scientific. Uh, it's just southeast of Demick. It's real thick. It's over like 200, 250 feet. Up, you get up to the New York border line, which is that horizontal line, continuous across there, and it thins out very quickly. It doesn't, I don't show it coming over this way, but it's sort of the same, more or less the same story. It gets very thin quickly. This, and the other thing you've got is, um, other than the, the, well, the, uh, the well logs on the organic content, is you've got the drilling logs. And this is something that kind of people don't think too much about. But when you drill one of these wells, you're getting back drill cuttings, and the drill cuttings are sampled, and they basically they show you what you're drilling through. You know, it's like a core sample. It just happens to come back all crumbly. Uh, and, and the drilling mud, the amount of drilling mud and the pressure, the weight of the mud that you have in the drilling column, if you hit gas, if, you drive, if you're going to the Black River and you go through the Marcellus and you get this big kick in the mud, the pressure, you hit a pressurized, over-pressurized, it's going to kick the mud right back up. And if you don't get quick, you're going to have to push, put more weight into it to keep it down. So the fact is, is even when you're drilling these things, you can just like viscerally know when you hit a highly pressurized gas formation. And most any well now would have a drilling log on it. So they would have a report on this, both the drill cutting and the mud log of, you know, that they would know that they hit a boom when they went through something. That's basically how they find the eagle fruit in South Texas is that, you know, when they get it, they know it when the mud starts going to come back up. So the, the, the data that's, that's is available, the media and the geologists took, and they project it, and unfortunately it's kind of fainter, but then they start projecting where they think the fairway is, you know, which always amused me that they would call it that. Um, and it, this is a case, that's the Marcellus Fairway, and it's, you know, it's, well, it's actually the Marcellus, it's probably the Utica, because uh, it goes all the way to the outcrop um, of, well, that's the, uh, that's the outcrop of the uh, Marcellus to the north end of Otsego County. So there's, you know, this huge area that's supposed to be productive. But then you take all this data, and, you, and more importantly, you take the data on the actual um, wells in Pennsylvania. We make some assumptions that, that the porosity is about the same, and you know, from one side of the border, that the carbon content is about the same, that it's all dry gas, it's not, you know, oil in um, Delaware County and dry gas and uh, Wayne County or something like that, that it's, that part of it is, is kind of continuous. And then you start taking the data of the wells, of the, these are IP initial production uh, data, and you start plotting it by township, as shown here, and you can see this graph over on the right, you go from some really uh, kick behind producers, 31, uh, 71, and you get, but you get down very quickly as the shale thins, and as and as, and also as the depth uh, becomes shallower, to some less productive wells. And then you get so we take that data, and uh, you, you can project it with fair amount of certainty over in the New York State, and you see that as you move over into Bro uh, Broom, Chemung, Tioga you get, you're, back, you're already into areas that would in Pennsylvania would be below average producers. You move, you move a little further north, even in, even in Broome County, and you get to what would probably be effectively a dry hole. So in other words, you extrapolate those results in Pennsylvania, over into New York. And so areas like uh, Chenango County and Otsego County, it's just, um, it's probably, they're just gonna be basically dry holes. And I mean, a dry hole is in the sense that oil, I mean, gas could go to $12 an MCF, and it's, 
it's probably unlikely that it would be drilled. It wouldn't be worth it. You get, um, well, you know, you get the same thing. You get to Schoharie County. You can make that out in that map. Or you get here, frankly. Uh, and it's just unlikely that the wells would be productive at the Marcellus. Now, so you think, well, does, what the curious thing is, is that, um, where is that darn arrow? That's the curious thing. <laughs> Oh, there it is. It just it, there. It's just that, and I'm kind of this being a bill. I'm restating this is that the we talk a little bit about the Utica, but these are the Utica test wells in the state. I mean, the Utica has been tested. They talk about it as it being some mysterious, you know, way down there. Well, actually, it's not so way down there because it's every time you go to the Black River, you get. So they came. The USGS came up with what they called the Utica Fairway. Uh, in the state of New York about two years ago. You know, same suspects, Broome County, Delaware. Uh, and this area had been leased, and this map is actually, Lou told me this is out of date. This has been, all these wells in Otsego County have been plugged and abandoned. When I did this map, actually Karen Edelstein did this map, I showed them as being um, temporarily abandoned, meaning they're in limbo. And now they're just, you know, going straight to hell with the rest of them. Um, meaning the Utica has been tested, the Marcellus has been tested in Otsego County, and they were dry holes, and they were p and a And again, you know, they had the mud logs, and they logged the wells. They tried to sell the leases. There's 23,000 acres involved here. Couldn't sell it. This was Gaston. It was a penny stock company out of Toronto. And then in Chenango County, it was Norris, who went bankrupt a week ago Friday. Same thing, they tested the Marcellus, they tested the Utica. This is in the fairway, you know, whatever the heck that's supposed to mean, of the, of the Utica and the Marcellus, and, um, you know, dry hole. They couldn't sell their leases, and they went bankrupt. So they basically proved that there is, that fairway does not exist, or it certainly doesn't extend that far more. This arrow is not cooperating. So then, sort of the validation of this is where are the actual uh, horizontally hydrofract well permit applications at the DEC, and there's are, there are a few. Where are they left? There were some Norse permits on file, but I, we can't erase them because they're toast. So this is basically, the, this is what's left in the whole empire state. Um, this is Chesapeake's. Uh, permits and Exxon's XTO permits. The XTO permit is at Greenland. And um, XTO is Exxon. Uh, they, and uh, Exxon XTO had five permits uh, as of the beginning of the year and they dropped four of them. So they're down to, they're down to one at the end, at the end if you don't mind. Uh, and so, I mean, what I mean, basically, that's where the industry think there might there might be some productive gas. These are these are Marcellus uh, permits, by the way. This doesn't mean that they're going to get them those permits. Mm -hmm. They haven't they've gone through environmental review. What it, all it really means is that um, is they have the spacing unit requirement, which is at, at nominally 640 acres a section a square mile. Uh, to ownership of those mineral rights to be able to to be able to get a, a, even apply for a permit, but I mean you know this. I remember we started out with a map that went all the way to Toronto, and you know we didn't think so as of two years ago, and this is where it is as of like a week ago. That's it, and you know, this is a curious thing. You know when you think about it, the people that have been hyping this, Cuomo and the rest of them, they know this. I mean. These are, these are on file with the DEC. Uh, this one happens to be up, this is the Exxon permit. It's literally right up the river from Josh, you know, on a trout stream. So, you know, good luck converting that to a well. Um, this you get a, on Gaslands 3 if you did. Um, then a quick thing on the, on the economics. Uh, this Marcellus and probably the Utica in, the, in New York is dry. The, as we s said, um, the, the New York State wells are probably less, are going to be less than the Pennsylvania. And the key thing here is that there's really no financing to go explore for dry gas. Uh, and those, those wells, those permits that I showed you were dry, glass, uh, dry gas. Uh, 
Lou doesn't think Chesapeake has, will have the budget to go even drill those wells. I mean, it's not like they didn't wouldn't have the money in absolute terms, but they just wouldn't allocate money to go explore for dry gas. The Exxon might do it, but the 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 gas wells in northeast Pennsylvania would have to the gas would have to be more than four dollars and fifty cents an MCF for them to even break even. It's like I don't know three dollars and eighty cents and change. So it's below break even. And if you can believe the Energy Information Agency, which you know nobody else does, uh, the gas prices won't be up. That will be adequate to drill those wells until like 2020. You know, and that's it takes some. You know, that's LNG. And so everything. if you need to tell us what dry gas is, no, let's let's do this. If we can't, let's have the questions at the end. If you don't want to do this. Don't understand what you're saying. Let's ho let's hold it at the end though, really, because I, I got a lot more here. Dry gas is methane. Liquid wet gas is propane. It's very simple. Uh, let's now. So then you've got you know kind of what are the downsides of overstating all this? Well, you know the one that that strikes us is that it's like the planning for the southern tier is sort of based on wishful thinking that all this is benefit. All these benefits are going to come in here. And that's you know, that's the whole southern tier economic development. Is that this is going to happen? What is if what is what happens if it doesn't happen? The people that are counting on gas to, you know, save the family farm. Right All these wildcat wells that would be drilled to test, they have the potential to pollute. Uh, any any one of these wells that gets drilled can ruin a road. If there's no road use agreement in place at the county or the town level, uh, a wildcatter will come here, tear up the roads. And if they don't find it, then they'll leave. And they don't, they're not obligated to pay anything to fix the road if they're not subject to a road user. And that's exactly what they do. You know, in Pennsylvania, they said, well, they fix the roads. What if they don't find any gas? You really think they're going to fix the road? They're not going to They're not going to fix the And, of course, the thing with New York is, is that whatever frack waste, drill cuttings, whatever comes out of Pennsylvania or anything south of here, they got to get rid of it somewhere. It's illegal to dump, to dump a... a you know, frack waste on a road in Texas, but it's legal here. You know, they call it brine, I think. Yeah. So it's like so you buy sardines in brine. Uh, quickly, um, the, none of this economically is sustainable. This is a study done in the Delaware uh, River Valley of the, the annual uh, value of different industries, timber being at the top. The value of the water alone is worth more than what the gas production would be, based even on these angulars, on those high estimates of what the productivity would be in Pennsylvania and in New York. And of course, the shale is not, you know, that's you're looking at maybe 10 years of that, even if everything worked right, versus these others, which are offensively or truly sustainable. The thing is, uh, the curious thing here is that I think. We think that Cuomo is, knows all this. It's hard to believe that he doesn't. He knows that there won't be any local jobs. It doesn't, you, you won't hire people locally to do a, a test well. There won't be any tax because a non-producing uh, well doesn't go on the ad valorem tax rolls. And a lot of these will be non-producers. Uh, so there aren't any votes. You know, the polls are going against it. He certainly doesn't seem to be in any rush. And lately, he starts, they're only talking about is casinos. You know, they don't even talk about uh, shale gas as being an economic driver anymore. They talk about casinos. As soon as they started talking about casinos, it told us, it's like, you know, he, he doesn't know what to do about this, frankly. If he green-lighted it, he'd only be dealing with about three or four permits. Just a second. Um, then, so, some conclusion. Oh, again, you have to be realistic about... Uh, what this what this equates to in terms of regional planning, town planning. I mean, the, anybody that thinks that they're going to, depending on where they are, that they're going to, that's going to bring jobs to the town. If they're, run, if they're running for political office, you know, it's going to be taxes and jobs. No, it's not going to be tax. It might be some jobs for, you know, some crews from out of state. Got to take the hype out of it. Um, the regs have got to anticipate that this isn't going to be such a gravy train. That they're going to, their regs are going to have to be a little bit more skeptical. I've written on this in some of my papers, but when you look at the regs in New York, they're actually worse than they are in most Western states. Mm. Uh, and you still have to address the downsides because they're going to, you know, they're going to have to get rid of those toxic radioactive drill cuttings somewhere. 
And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to say, let's turn it right.